Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, we'll begin our reading at verse 14. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. But not long after, there rose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurycladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which, when we had taken up and used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest we should fall into the quicksand, struck sail, and so were driven. And we, being earnestly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall no, be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou, hast, thou must be brought before Cedar, Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as, he told, as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, and as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country, and sounded, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and it came fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should be fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and wished for day. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We often refer to the trials and tribulations that we face in life as the, as the storms of life. The reality is that uh, all of life is a storm. And for those without Christ, there is no peace and security in the here and now, and there is no peace certainly in the hereafter. Only Christ is a sure anchor of the soul. Now, by that, I am not meaning the uh, rather subjective peace of mind that we may have here for, for a moment, uh, the relief that uh, may come because we hear some good news as opposed to bad news or something of that nature. Because such a, a peace is, is gone when our mental, physical, or, or uh, social equi equilibrium is, is, is upset by something. That kind of peace is based on, on feelings, which are subject to too many things to even consider, really. I'm referring to the, the reality of our relationship with God, our, our peace with God. It's interesting, you know, you look at all the epistles. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from Lord Jesus Christ. The assurance of a heavenly hereafter. And because of God's grace, we have that, that peace. Now, people today, and we, this, is a, this is the dominant religion here in western Washington. People together strive to, to piece, some, uh, piece together some kind of a, a philosophy of life and hope that they, they hope will uh, work for them. It's a, a buffet of ideas and tidbits of religion strung together that gives themselves a, a sense of purpose, fulfillment, and of course, peace of mind. This personal spirituality this cobbled together, customized religion all about me is a grand delusion and has no authority outside of our own minds. And yet that's the dominant thing here in the Northwest. Since God is in control of my destiny, doesn't it make, doesn't it make more sense, a great deal of sense, that we should seek to know what his mind is in regard to these things? Now, in the passage we're going to be looking at, it says that Christ is an anchor, that he is an anchor of my soul. 
And it's not based on the wishful, on wishful thinking. It's based on the work and promise of God. Now, last time we looked at the Abrahamic covenant and some things that went with that and the piece of the pie that we get with that covenant. That they're in also dealing with the new covenant. That we have a promise that through you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. All peoples of the earth be blessed. That's part of the Abrahamic covenant that you and I get the piece of. And ultimately that is in the idea of what we saw in the new covenant there in Jeremiah 31. Verses 31 through 34. That there is forgiveness to be had. That we need a Messiah, we need the anointed one, we need the deliverer, we need the one who is going to propitiate the righteous, just judgment of God. That we might have forgiveness, that we then might have peace with God and therefore peace of mind and peace of heart. I don't have to worry about who's looking after me, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to go or where I'm going to end up. You know, so, the last song we sang... And most of, a great many of us, I won't say if it's most, probably is. The last verse deals with death. It is a reality. It is something that is going to happen. I have been pastoring Grace Baptist Church for 22 years. And as I look out here in this room, you know how many people were here 22 years ago that, that, that other than my wife and me? None of you. None of you. Some are different places around the world. Some are different parts of the state. There's a few people that uh, are probably still in the community that stopped coming. Mostly it's most people have moved on. But a lot of people, I have buried a lot of people. Where am I going to spend eternity? What is my hope? What is my peace when I step into the hereafter? It's in Christ. He is an anchor for my soul. We're going to look at two verses today, the last two verses of chapter 6. And I'll pause, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments as we read through the text here. Verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What's the hope he's talking about? Now granted, it's italicized, which means it's not in the original text, but he's alluding to what went on before. He is dealing with the promise. He's dealing with the promise that was made to Abraham. And he's also dealing with the work that was accomplished on the cross of Calvary, which was promised in the Old Testament. Okay, we talked about this last time. The New Covenant. We're going to be doing the Lord's Supper probably next week. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This was the ratification of the new covenant. That the shed blood allows for the forgiveness that is tied to the new covenant. Without that shed blood of Jesus, there can be, <coughs> excuse me, there can be no forgiveness. Christ God is a just God. He must punish sin. Jesus bore our penalty. He suffered the punishment of our sin. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the scripture says. And therefore, since God's judgment was poured out on the Son, I can have forgiveness. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ died in my stead. In God's eyes, I died on the cross. The penalty was paid. And therefore, I can go free. I can be forgiven. And so with this, we have an anchor for the soul that is sure and steadfast. It is certain. It is reliable. On what basis? Promise of God. And that was the illustration he used. Just as certain as God made a promise to Abraham and it came to pass. Okay? Exalted father, whose name gets Abram, who gets his name changed to Abraham, father of a multitude. He's married to a woman who is 10 years younger than he is. Oh, he's got a child bride. No, she's 90. And he's 100. Where's the child? Oh, next year at this time, you'll have that child. <laughs> All right. And so when he's born, they name him Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. Because God kept his word. God kept his promise. <clears throat> Your descendants will be like the, the sand by the seashore in multitude. Isaac is 60 years old. He and his wife have been married for 20 years. No children. Where's the promise going to come? And then she has twins. And God says, it's one of these. One of these will be the answer to the promise. His name is Jacob. He's changed to Israel. Now, he starts having kids. 
He has 12 sons. And they become the, the forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Is that all the children, though, that we're talking about? Now, granted, there's a, there's a lot of descendants of Abraham in the world today. There's a lot of Jewish people in the world today. But the heirs are not limited to that. Because the aspect, now, I don't get the promise of the land. I don't get the promise of a multitude of descendants. I don't get the promise of, you know, there's, what, do I, what part of the promise do I get? Through you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Ultimately, the promise is that I can receive forgiveness, that I can be reconciled to my creator through that promise that one would come who would make reconciliation. I can have forgiveness. I can have a right relationship with my creator because of forgiveness that comes through what Christ did for me. That's the promise. Which hope we have as an anchor for the soul. It's based on the promise of God. It's based on the work of Jesus Christ. Those two things combined are the basis for our, for our salvation. God made a promise. It's a sure thing. Now, we, we get tired of promises. People make all sorts of, of promises. We, we deal with campaign promises. We get uh, uh, promises, oh, I'll be there. Oh, I'll take care of this. I'll take you. Don't have, you don't have a thing to worry about. <laughs> yeah, we do. Because most of the time, people don't keep their word. And even if they are honest people and they have the best of intentions, circumstances may arise. Things may happen that may prevent me from doing the thing that I really wanted to do and was planning on doing and had, had set aside the time and the resources so that I'd be able to keep my word, but something happened beyond my control. Is anything beyond God's control? No, when God keep, makes a promise, it's a certainty. We look at things that are only in the past as certainties. But for God, past, present, and future, if he has, if, has made a, a promise, if he has said something will be, you can count on it. You can count on it. It's as certain as God is certain. God cannot lie. It is reliable. It is an anchor for the soul. And with that, he keeps us. He keeps us. He keeps us from danger. He keeps us from error. He keeps us from shipwreck. Shipwreck has become a, um, a figure of speech. I, I, I pray for a number of people, and, and as, I pray, as, I, as I pray during the course of the week, I will, I will sometimes use the word shipwreck in regard to certain people. What am I talking about? When we talk about someone whose, whose faith was shipwrecked, what does that mean? That means that they went through some tragedy, some, something happened, and they've lost their faith. They've lost it all. They, they have set aside the, the thing that they once embraced, and it's gone. If we truly are trusting Christ, if we are truly born again, we cannot, cannot really be shipwrecked. We may founder a little bit. We may go through tr some trials. We may go through some, some seriously bumpy roads. But we'll never be shipwrecked. It's an anchor for the soul. In the Sunday school service, I was alluding to those that, that preach a, a false gospel, a prosperity gospel, that you need to be happy, healthy, and prosperous in your life. Your, your best life now. Which to me, to say that, is a terrifying prospect. You mean right now is the best I've got? You mean right now is the best that I could ever anticipate? You mean that heaven is going to be no better than what I've got now? That to, to see my Savior with my own eyes, to, to be freed from the infirmity of this flesh, to be, to be outside of this world and to step into the presence of God is going to be no better than what I have now? My best life now? What a tragedy! What a lie. I have an anchor for the soul that, yes, he anchors me in the here and now. But it's for my soul. Now, we take care of our bodies. If, 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 there's, if I've got a rock in my shoe, it talks to me. 
Uh, if I have a, um, a tickle in my throat, as you've noticed here this morning, it talks to me and ends up talking to you too. We, we, we take care of our bodies. And yet, uh, I'm grateful that this isn't the thing I'm going to be having for all eternity. I'm going to get a, a new one. I'm going to have a glorified body that's going to be free from all the infirmities and difficulties of this flesh. My soul, my spirit is a permanent thing. Christ, the promise of God, the work of God, is an anchor for the soul. Now, if he had said it's an anchor for the body, that's, that's not necessarily a great deal of comfort. That's very temporal. That's very pass, that's passing. That's, that's, that's not something that has any endurance. But here we have something that's beyond this life. It's not limited to the here and now. And then he says, we have an anchor for the, the soul, both sure and steadfast, certain, which entereth into that within the veil. Now you're like, what's he talking about? I have no idea what he's saying. What is the idea between, with going into the veil? All right, let's, let's, let's back up 2,000 years. Okay, we're going to go in reverse. We're going to go back about 2,000 years. When this book was written, and by the way, it says right there at the top, and the context indicates this, who is the author writing to? He's writing to Jewish believers. Those who have a Jewish background, but they are born again. They have accepted Jesus Christ as the, the promised Messiah. Due to some other things that are mentioned in here, this, this, uh, the writer and the recipients are within the, the boundaries of the Roman Empire. It mentions Timothy at the very end of the book. And he also deals with the temple service in the, in the present tense. So almost certainly the temple in Jerusalem is still in existence. It hadn't been destroyed by the Romans yet. It's still in existence. Many of the recipients of this letter, many of those who would have heard it from, for the first time, were people who had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They had seen the temple. They had seen the priests in their, their vestments. They had seen the, the sacrifices being offered. They had perhaps offered sacrifice themselves, probably had. They, all had. they had a first-hand knowledge of what he's talking about. Now, when you go, when you, if you were to go to the temple in Jerusalem at this time, and, and going back into your Old Testament era as well, you're dealing with a building that did not have seats in it like a church. It was not a place that people went into to worship. It was a building that represented the presence of God. And how do I gain access to God? It had two rooms. Now, let's, we, the layout of our building here will, will help you to imagine this. All right? This front room here, where we're all sitting right now, this is going to be the holy place. Let's say where the screen is, you've got, you got a couple of double doors. That's the only way in, the only way out. The priest would come in, and the priest came into this first room every day. You had the table of showbread, you had the altar of incense, and you had the lampstand. And that's all that was in there. And the priests came in and they burned incense on the altar every day. They tended the lamps, made sure there was enough oil in there to keep the lights burning. Every week they changed the bread. And the priests would eat the old bread, they put fresh bread on the table. In the back is not a wall, but a curtain. It's a big, when this was written, it was a big, huge, thick thing. Probably, they said, it's a, the, Josephus says it's a hand breadth thick. It could probably stand up on its own. The building in the first century, these people would be familiar with it, was a very tall building, so, uh, probably about six stories high, maybe higher. And that curtain went all the way up. A great, huge, massive, heavy curtain. One day out of the year, Day of Atonement, the high priest would go behind the curtain. That was the only day of the year that anybody went behind that curtain. And only the high priest. He, went, didn't, he didn't have any helpers. He went himself. Now, when this was written, after the captivity, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. We don't know where it is. 
We don't know what happened to it. So there's nothing back there when this was written. There was an empty room. But following the temple protocols, following the, the book of Leviticus, they went through the same process whether the ark was there or not. And once a year, the high priest would go back. He went there twice in one day. He went, he made a sacrifice for himself, went back and sprinkled the blood around the Ark of the Covenant, make atonement for himself, and then go through the process again and make atonement for the nation. The Holy of Holies, that room behind the curtain, represented the very presence of God. In the Old Testament era, you had the, the, what is sometimes referred to as the Shekinah glory of God that rested above the ark. It was a, a glowing cloud of some sort. It's talked about a number of times in the Old Testament. And it represented the very presence of God. To gain access to the presence of God, you had to have the high priest with blood, the sacrificed blood of an animal. The ark represented the, the presence of God. It represented the integrity of the covenant. That's the, 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 the tables that, that Moses brought down from, uh, from the mountain originally were inside the ark, inside that holy, holy, holy place. Now that covenant, the one made at Sinai there in, in the book of Exodus, was a two-part covenant. God said, you do this, I'll do this. But if you fail to keep your part of the deal, then I will punish you. So I will bless and prosper you if you're obedient, and if you're not obedient, I will punish you and eventually kick you out of the land. Your ability to stay in the promised land is based on your obedience. Before God made this offer, the children of Israel, Exodus chapter 19, said, All that the Lord, will, all the Lord has said, we will do. Moses goes up to the mountain, gets the commandments and so on, comes back down, presents them to the people, and they say it again. All the Lord has said, we will do. And then they didn't. And more than half of Israel's history has been spent outside of the land. Now, they're back there in part today. Because God has to have them in the land to do some things that he promised he will do. But their ability to stay there, the fulfillment of what we see in the New Covenant, the, the fulfillment of being in the promised land, still has not reached its, its, its utter complete fulfillment until the Lord returns. The glory left the temple there in Ezekiel chapters 10 and 11, but it will return in the Millennial Temple as recorded there in Ezekiel 43. Again, Leviticus 16, the high priest goes behind the veil, behind that curtain. Back to our text. Which entereth into, the, into that within the veil. Mosaic law. Law given in Exodus. Who, and in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, who could go behind the curtain in accord with the law? Only the high priest. Only on the Day of Atonement. The rest of the time, nobody went back there. Nobody else was allowed to go back there. Only the high priest, only on that day. Only with the blood of the sacrifice. Verse 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We have some interesting things going on as far as the fulfillment of your Old Testament. And this is, this is what the, the book of Hebrews is basically a New Testament commentary on the book of Leviticus. So... You're going to have to put your thinking cap on. You're going to have to follow what I'm, what I'm saying. If you've been following us so far. Okay, we've got the layout of the temple. We have the curtain across the back there. Holy of Holies representing the very presence of God. Jesus is our forerunner. That word only occurs here in your whole New Testament. And I'm, ta I'm talking about the, the Greek word. 
that's behind this. And even I don't think Forerunner even occurs anyplace else either. It means one who is a, a scout, one who, who, who goes, a trailblazer, if you will. I know you keep thinking of four by four vehicles, but you get the idea. He paved the way for those to follow. He is the, the guarantor of our later entrance. Provision, the possibility of access is made by this, this forerunner, this scout. Access is now available. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 38. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 45. The instant Christ died on the cross, something happened inside the temple. Now, Jesus was quite some distance away. He's hanging on a cross. He can't physically do anything. And yet something miraculous happened inside the temple. That gigantic curtain, again, as thick as your, your hand is wide, not like this, but like this, six stories high, was torn in two from top to bottom the instant Christ died. By the way, later on in the book of Acts, it says that a great company of the priests believed. Because they were the only ones that would have been able to see that. They knew it had happened. They knew that something had happened that physically, humanly, was not possible. And yet it happened. The veil was torn. Why did that happen? Who did it? How did it happen? What, what's the significance of this, this torn veil? Now remember, Old Testament dispensation, the Mosaic Law... Only the high priest one day of the year with the blood of the sacrifice. Christ dies. It is finished. The veil is torn from top to bottom. The way is now open. It is no longer limited to the high priest. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. When we started going through Hebrews, we, we, we covered this a little bit, but different people in time, passing of time to love. So I'll give you a reminder. What in the world is a priest? And don't think he's just a guy that wears a special outfit and he's got a backwards collar or whatever the case may be. Okay, a priest, whether you're deal, as far as definition, whether you're talking about the Old Testament, whether you're talking about uh, paganism or anything, the idea of a priest is that he is a mediator. He is a go-between between the worshipers and God. Because in religion whether you're talking about revealed religion in the Old Testament or paganism or anything else, people don't have access to God. I've got to go through somebody to get to God. I don't have direct access. Now, we don't think that way so much these days because of the church and because of what happened here. But the fact of the matter is that we have access to our Creator because we have a great high priest who is Jesus Christ. This is why we pray in Jesus' name. He is the authority that allows us access to our Creator. And with that, because the veil has been torn, because I, I myself, as a child of God, have access. There's two things I want you to understand. Number one, over and over and over again in the Scripture, almost all the epistles, believers... All believers are called saints. A saint simply means a holy one. Saints are not limited to a special, upper crust, top of the line class of believers. It is anybody who has truly put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a saint. Biblically, you're a saint. And I'll let you in on something else. You're also a priest. You have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. You have been, in God's eyes, made holy. You are now a saint. And 
Because the veil has been torn, because Christ has paid the way, because of our great high priest, we have access to the Father, and therefore we are priests. He is our forerunner. He is the scout. The idea is that we will follow. Whether the forerunner is for us entered. <coughs> Christ did, in essence, as far as God's economy is concerned, what the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. Christ shed his blood, paid the penalty of humanity's sin, and the veil was torn. We get to follow, we are invited. The gospel is preached. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel call, the gospel invitation. We get to follow based on the, on the merit of our forerunner. Our great high priest who has made propitiation, satisfaction of justice on our behalf. Justice satisfied, forgiveness, reconciliation is now available through Christ. The veil has been torn. And then it says, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the whole Melchizedek thing is what chapter 7 is about. We'll deal with that when we get there. But I, wanna, I want you, a priest forever. The priests in the Old Testament, it was a lifetime appointment. It was hereditary. It was the son of the high priest who succeeded the son of the high priest who succeeded the son of the high priest. Just like kings. It was a hereditary position. God appointed that. No volunteers. It's an appointment by God. It's hereditary. Aaron, the, the brother of Moses, was the first high priest. His son Eleazar succeeded him. His son Phineas succeeded him. And I couldn't tell you who did it after that. Although we have the lists in your Bible. That's one of the reasons you have the genealogies. There, there have been, throughout your Old Testament economy, probably, well over a hundred high priests. Why did you have to keep having a new high priest? There's two reasons. Number one, they kept dying. All right. Phineas, been gone a long time. Aaron, been gone a long time. Eleazar, gone a long time. They got old, they died. But also, all those sacrifices that they were doing, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, never really dealt with the sin problem. The book of Hebrews says that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. They were a symbol of the sacrifice that would, but they, they couldn't really deal with the sin problem. They were symbolic, just like our, our Lord's Supper is a remembrance looking back. The animal sacrifices were a symbol looking forward to. And so we have an eternal priest who doesn't die because he died once but he rose again. He is alive today making intercession for us, acting as our great high priest. How many sacrifices did Jesus have to make as our great high priest? One. Just one. The sacrifice was sufficient for all. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is sufficient for all, but it, we don't believe in universalism that everybody is going to heaven. The Bible makes it very clear that's not the case. Because it's applied to our account only by faith. Again, John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith and belief, same word in the original language. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. One sacrifice, once for all, it is finished, paid in full. No additional sacrifices needed. Christ's sacrifice on the cross accomplished all that was necessary. He is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He accomplished all that was necessary. The results are everlasting. The sacrifice of Christ is never exhausted. It never expires. It is all sufficient. Here we are 2,000 years later. You put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrifice that was made 2,000 years ago gets applied to your account today. It doesn't, you don't, you don't, it's never exhausted. And if the Lord tarries 1,000 years from now, people who are born again then will receive the same benefit. And he's permanent because he never dies. There is no need of a successor. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able to, even to save them unto the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. What is Jesus doing right now? Right now. He's alive. He's in heaven. What is he doing right now? Scripture says he's doing two things. He's making intercession for us, and he's preparing a place for us. The priesthood is permanent. And it says, and we'll expand on this next time, it's after the order of Melchizedek. It is an older priest, priesthood than that of Levi or Aaron. By the way, when did Melchizedek live? live? We're going to get into this when we get into the next, uh, next chapter. But just thinking about this. He was a contemporary of Abraham. He lived at the same time as Abraham. So he, ex he, was, he was living, he was walking the earth 400 years before Aaron. It is an older priesthood than that of Levi. And we'll see as we get into the next chapter, it is a greater priesthood than that of Levi. So we have an anchor for the soul. Not just to get us through the here and now, but a guarantee of the hereafter as well. So what is the, the basis for your hope? Where is your anchor cast? Is it something you piece together? Is it something that you hope gives you peace of mind? Well, I, I believe this and, and that works for me. Yes, but does it work for God? The work and promise of God or a buffet of your own thoughts and ideas. He is an anchor for the soul. Not just dealing with the, the presence, the present, but rather eternal, e eternal things. Have you trusted Christ? Is your anchor Jesus Christ? Is it based on the promise of God or your own wishful thinking? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what Christ has done. Thank you that he has paid the way, that he is the forerunner, that he has made atonement for our sins. He has made propitiation. He is the satisfaction of justice. He is the Savior. He is the only priest that we will ever need. He is the anchor for the soul. Father, if there's somebody under the sound of my voice that has never trusted Christ, they're uncertain beyond their own wishful thinking. They're uncertain as to where they're going to spend eternity. Father, I ask that today might be that day of salvation. They might put their trust in what Christ has done for them, accepting the promise of God, and be certain of the peace that only you give. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.